And that's a really good question for us, isn't it? Whose shoes are we supposed to be walking in? I mean, it's easy for us to walk in the world's shoes or our own shoes. But how easy is it for us to walk in Christ's shoes? See the world as he sees it. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you for your love for us and your guidance. We thank you for the day that you've given us, the week that you're going to give us. We thank you for the health, just the ability to think of the reason to come before you. And I pray, Lord, today that you will guide and direct us, that you will open our hearts and minds, that you will help us to learn from you. Lord, we come from different cultural backgrounds, different experiences. We walk in different shoes. But I just pray that you will communicate with us as well. And that we hear your voice today. In Christ. You know, Grace was about to start a video, and I do want to, you to see the video. Uh, I want you to pay very close attention to what's happening. All right, it's very short, but if we can get the lights, uh, somebody, and then um, we'll watch this really quick video. Last week, how many of you went to the camp last week? Raise your hands. 
And a lot of people went there. Last week, the theme of our church-wide retreat was that there was hope in the darkness. What were some of the points that stuck out to you? Shout them out. What did you hear? Oh, come on, please. You, yeah, you were there. Okay. What were some of the points that stuck out to you? Yeah, Angel. there would be good weather? Yeah, there was, wasn't it? Okay. What what else stood out to you from that? Joe. So basically it's like Satan. It's like basically the meaning of hope in the darkest. I feel like it means um, God will not let you be tempted as much as you can resist. Because like, the darkness, I think, is Satan and then the whole thing is this. Okay. Satan is definitely in the darkness, and Satan is definitely oftentimes manipulating that darkness around us, right? But God is the hope in that darkness, because he is not going to let us be tempted beyond what we're able to resist. You're right. Okay. Anything else, Stan? What, what, did, what did Pastor Victor say about the fact that whose fault is the darkness? <laughs> Satan does, which is it? Okay, yeah, that's what we're going way back to there about the beginning of that darkness, true. Let me help you out. One thing that he said was that a lot of things, we're in, a, we're in a world where there's a lot of darkness that's not necessarily we caused. It's just there. It's something that historically has happened over a period of time. We're affected by it, other people's actions, other people's sins, and we suffer for it. We're in that darkness. But he said something else too. He said that oftentimes we're putting our own blinders on. We're allowing ourselves to be dark. We live in the darkness because of various reasons that we decide, you know, to be afraid of something or it's too challenging for us or whatever. We, we just don't agree with it. And so we put on these spiritual blinders to keep us from really seeing. It keeps us, when we look at people oftentimes, from seeing who they really are. Part of that darkness sometimes lets us judge others, lets us see others as the way we want to classify them, as maybe the world tells us to classify them. It is basically a lie. It, these are lies that keep us from seeing the person beneath the, beneath the appearance, reactions, oftentimes. See, one of the sad truths that we face is that we are in a battle, yes, but it's not just against maybe some nebulous darkness. We end up fighting against each other. We end up fighting against other people who are like us, caught in the darkness. The thing is, is that we know from Scripture that our real foes or the powers and the principalities, the forces of darkness behind the players. The players themselves are often merely pawns in this large struggle. There was a movie that came out a few years, several years ago actually, called The Matrix. And I've mentioned things about this before, but one thing that I think that really sticks out to me about this movie is if you know anything about the movie, there's it's like humanity is under control. It's being used by artificial intelligence. I won't go into all of that. But it's being used basically as, uh, as slaves. And that humanity is in this dreamlike state. 
They see life, everything looks normal to them, but they are at, that's not the reality. There's that real reality there over their slaves. And in this one scene where Neo and uh, his girlfriend are basically rescuing Morpheus, they are going to rescue this guy, and they have to go through this building, and they have to shoot a lot of people to get there. And there's these police officers that he thinks they're just blowing him away, right? And you say, well, that's not reality. But it is reality for them. And the thing that always strikes me when I see that is these are innocent people. People who believe that they are doing right. That are being completely destroyed. Because they are living a lie. How many times are there people in our lives who are so caught up in lies that they, they can't see the truth and we ourselves are responsible for maybe destroying them. We ourselves are the ones who are causing them to stumble. How many times are we not willing to see the truth about other people? Jesus came into the world to free us from the darkness. To open our eyes to the truth and expose the lies. To enable us for the first time to see clearly. To choose. And those who refuse to see, they condemn themselves. But for those who choose Christ. Look at Romans 8.1 and see what it says. Read it with me. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Read it again. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you believe that? Do you understand what that means? If we are in Christ, that judgment, that condemnation is not there for us. We've been freed from it. What a promise, what a, what a hope in this present darkness that we are in. Yet, there's even more to the story. Because God has entrusted us to be torches in the darkness. To shine for Him. Now some of you may feel, well, I'm not very much of a torch. Remember Pastor Victor talked about, he had that little pin light, right? And I remember, I think it was Dana said there was something about being a pimple. Wasn't it you? Yeah? Okay. Some of us are, are like pin lights, it seems. We, we, we don't feel that we are that, that strong. But God has called us to be more than just pin lights. But even a pin light in the very other darkness can cast its light for a long way because darkness cannot consume the light. thing is, is, are we shining for God? Are we shining for Christ? Or instead, are we one of those flash darts that he was talking about? The flash dark that instead of shining light, it shines darkness. Is that who we are? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That's not who we are. Exactly. We're not called to be that. We're called to be lights. We're called to be torches. We're called to burn lights for God. But unfortunately, sometimes we allow ourselves instead of be flashlights. We allow ourselves to shine the darkness rather than the light. The thing is that we can't walk in the shoes of the world. We must instead walk in the shoes of Christ. We must act and react to the world around us like Christ does, and not like the world acts. Today we're going to look at a very familiar story. We're going to look at John 8, 2 through 11. Starts out like this. It says, At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him. He sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees 
brought in a woman caught in adultery, and they made her stand before the group. And said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? And they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at him. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left, but the woman was still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are you? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. There's three big lessons I think that we can pull from this about how to react to those caught in the darkness. The first one is we must see them as Jesus does, not like others do. We must see them as Jesus does, not like other does, others do. What crosses your mind when you see someone caught up in the darkness? Let me explain a little bit about some of the darkness we can get caught up in. Maybe you see somebody who is involved in sexual immorality. Maybe you know someone, he's cheating on his wife. You know, he's an adulterer. Or, or maybe they're caught in some kind of, of vice like pornography. You know, pornography is a huge thing. I've known really good people, people that you would never suspect who are caught in pornography. Married men caught in pornography. Leaders in the church caught in pornography. Or, or maybe they have a secret drug problem. Or maybe they have a problem with gambling. Or maybe they have some other kinds of things. There's a lot of stuff out there that can trap people in the darkness. There's idolatry of various forms. Because what is idolatry? I'm not talking just going to some idol and bowing down. Putting anything before God. Putting your career before God. Putting school before God. Putting money before God. Sports, Sports before God. Oh, now, now you're stepping on toes. <laughs> <laughs> anything that you put before God is idolatry. It could be even the love of family. If that becomes so much more important to you than God, it's an idol. And we can get trapped in this darkness. What crosses, though, your mind when you see someone who is trapped in the darkness? It's easy to look down on them, isn't it? Why do we do it? It makes us feel better. <laughs> At least I'm not like them. At least I'm not like them. We can pat our own backs. I don't know if we can reach that far. We can say that there by the grace of God go we. It's not a bad statement unless you're if you're unless you're saying it audibly. But Paul doesn't pull any punches when he speaks about this in 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11. That's what he says. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexual, sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ 
and by the Spirit of our God. And you might say to me, well, Pastor John, maybe, but I'm not an adulterer. I'm not a sexually immoral person. I'm not this. But you notice he used some other things in there, too. Like greedy. Anybody ever been greedy in here? Let me ask a bigger question. Anybody not been greedy? Okay? See, see the thing is, the sin is so pervasive. And this is not an exhaustive list. I mean, we have another passage that talks about liars. The thing is, is that darkness, it's, it's really easy to get caught up in. So when you think about it, when you think about this judgment, realize that we can't judge because we've done the same kinds of things. We do the same thing. Was this woman an adulteress? Absolutely. She was committing the sin. She was caught in it. She was an adulteress. But how people reacted to her, how the, the, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees reacted to her, and how Jesus reacted to her, was very, very different. When you see somebody caught in sin, do you act like the teachers of the law and the Pharisees? Or do you act like Jesus? See, all the teachers of the law and the Pharisees and, and the, the other people that we have around us a lot of times, the world, all they would see would be the adulterer. And the adulterous. But what does Jesus see? Jesus sees a woman. A woman who is caught in sin and who needs saved. So when you see people who are engaging in, in, in sin, do you see them as, you sinner! You see a pure person in need of Jesus just like we are. We are Jesus' ambassadors. Meaning, we must act, we must react, we must see as he does. Not as the rest of the world says. Second point here is that we see that Jesus. Not only does he not see her like the others are seeing her, but he is learning to, or he does, treat people with compassion, not as judge and jury. Treat people as with, with compassion and not as judge and jury. How many of you enjoy being slapped? Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> anybody anybody like that? No. How many how many of you enjoy being hurt? Hurt. No? Okay. How about how many of you enjoy being judged? Do you like being judged? Sort of. Okay. None of us normally <laughs> like being judged. None of us enjoy being hurt. None of us enjoy being slapped. But when we see people caught up in sin, it's easy. It's easy to, in some ways, not necessarily physically, but to hurt them, to slap them, to have that look, have that attitude toward them that says, I reject you. I'm better than you. You somehow are beneath me. When we see people caught up in sin, it's easy to forget that they have the same feelings, the same fears, the same longings that we do. You see somebody, you see a, 
let's say you, you see a prostitute on, on the street corner. Did you ever stop to think that she has the same fears, the same longings, the same desires as you and I? When you see that that guy in, in your school that, man, he's messed up. You, maybe the teacher doesn't recognize it, but you see that he's been using something. Maybe you guys don't have drugs in your school. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but you know, I mean, you can see it in the eyes and everything else, right? And your first reaction may be, hey, yeah, look at the drug. But you ever stop to think why he's doing it? Do you ever think that that person has the same fears, the same longings, the same desires that you have? <clears throat> Instead, often consciously or unconsciously, we set these people apart in our minds. We classify them. We judge them. Yesterday, my wife and I were driving along the road, and we saw a biker. And um, as we were coming home, this, this biker, and he had the tattoos, he had the kind of almost like the, the Nazi helmet on. He had the uh, he had the you know the cut shirt with Harley and everything else and he was kind of overweight and everything. But the bike that he was driving on was not your typical bike. It was one of those, you know, that you would see that you know, more expensive bike that some you know other people would necessarily would make use. Right? And it got us to thinking about it. But it got me to thinking about it, too. Because, yeah, this guy fit that stereotype of biker. In other words, the stereotype is, oh, the guy who's loud, he's obnoxious, he drinks a lot of beer, he, he goes to the, the biker bars, he, he treats women like he owns them, he's got a real foul mouth and everything. And, and we have this impression. But that man very... Quite frankly, he could have been an accountant someplace, he could have been, had a family man. There's a lot of different things he could have been. But the snap judgment, classic. Jesus tells us not to judge unless we be judged. And, and I don't mean by that that we can't detect sin, that we can't discern sin, because we are called to do that. But we are never, ever, ever called to be judge and jury. We are never, ever, ever called to condemn and to reject. James offers an additional thought on this in James 4, 12. He says, there is only one lawgiver and judge. The one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? You and I, we're, we're not the lawgiver. We're not the judge. Christ himself did not come to judge. And what gives us the right? Why should we? As Christ ambassadors, judging is not our job. It's a Jewish writer by the name of A.J. Jacobs. And a few years ago, he wrote a book called The Year of Living Biblically. One man's humble quest to follow the Bible as literally as possible. And he spent the year trying to follow the Old Testament. Trying to live the way the Bible taught. And so he, on day 62 of his experiment, he tried to put into practice the command to stone an adulterer. Now, this sounds like, okay, really? You know, but yes, this is what he decided to do because it was in the Bible. So he records wandering into Central Park, meeting a mid-70-ish man who was sitting on a park bench. And he comes up to him, and I'm going to read from here. He comes up and he tells the man, I'm trying to live by the rules of the Bible. The Ten Commandments, stoning adulterers. 
guy looks at it and says, you stoning adulterers? Yeah, stoning adulterers. I'm an adulterer. You're currently an adulterer. Yeah, tonight, tomorrow, yesterday, two weeks from now. Are you going to stone me? If I could, yes, that would be great. I'll punch you in the face. I'll send you to the cemetery. He's serious. This isn't a cutesy, grumpy old man. This is an angry old man. This is a man with seven decades of hostility behind him. I fish my pebbles from my back pocket. I, I wouldn't stone you with big stones, I say. Just these little guys. I open my palm to show him the pebbles. He lunges at me, grabbing one out of my hand, then flinging it at my face. It whizzes by my cheek. I'm stunned for a second. I, I hadn't expected this grizzled old man to make the first move. But now there's nothing stopping me from retaliating. An eye for an eye. I take one of the remaining pebbles and whip it to his chest. It bounces off. I'll punch you right in the kisser, he says. Well, you really shouldn't commit adultery. Can you see this happening? And we laughed at this, 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 this happening. But can you imagine going out and seeing sin like that and deciding that you need to take action? You need to be the judge of it. Contrast this with how Jesus treats the adulteress. Do you see Jesus picking up a stone? Do you, do you see Jesus saying, you adulteress, and, and just railing on it? No. He treats her with compassion, not as a judge and a jury. You see, the third lesson that we need to understand here is that while we need to see Jesus, I mean, we need to see people as Jesus does and not like others do. And we need to treat people with compassion, not as a judge and jury. We need to see how Jesus takes it even a step further. To accept the sinner, not the sin. To accept the sinner and not the sin. Jesus never says that what she has done is okay. See, sometimes we take it too far. We say, okay, well, if I'm not supposed to condemn the adulterer or condemn the, the druggie or condemn the thief or whatever, I'm just so, supposed to say, okay. And the world will tell us that. The world will tell us that, oh, it's just a different lifestyle, it's a different this, whatever. If you're not supposed to judge, just tolerate it and let it go. Just say, in fact, say it's okay. Jesus never does that. He never says this is okay. But he doesn't blast the person who is committing it. Instead, he addresses the sin. The answer for why he does this is in Luke 19.10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He never came to condemn them. He came to save them. We, you and me, we can't save anyone. But we are to be Christ's representatives on this earth. So it's our job not to reject the lost, but to seek out the lost. And to try to point them to the one who can save them. To point them to repentance. But the thing is that the lost aren't the only ones caught in sin. Am I correct? There are Christians caught in sin. In fact, maybe you are caught in sin. Christians can get trapped in sin, but how should we react to it? Look at Galatians 6.1. It says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you may also make a temple. Our job when we see others, our brothers and sisters, caught up in something, 
yes, we should try to restore them. We should confront them. And if we're not going to have time for that, but there was definitely a, a series of steps for confronting people who are caught in sin. But our job is not to just outwardly just throw them away. We're to seek to restore them, to treat them with compassion. Jesus sees not as others see. He treats with compassion, not condemnation. He seeks to save instead of reject. Do we? Do we? So we come to our big questions. Are we following Jesus' example? Or are we following someone else's? Are we, are we following, are we stepping in the shoes of those who are more likely to point their fingers? Or are we instead stepping in the sandals of Jesus who is going to look at each other and at other people with compassion? The title of the sermon was, Therefore, no condemnation. What I meant by that is this. In following Jesus, therefore there should be no condemnation of other people. Not only no condemnation of ourselves, but no condemnation of others. That should always be the lenses, the glasses that we see the people around us. May God help us see people through his eyes. We're going to come to a time of communion, a time when we have a chance to kind of reflect back on who we are in Christ. And as we get to that point, I want us to be mindful of this. Are we really following Christ in all of us? Are we really trying to see the world through his eyes? Are we really trying to be his ambassadors, or are we just focused on ourselves? On our personal relationship with Christ, rather than how we are supposed to relate to others. So that they 
they also know the Lord Jesus and receive the salvation. Help us to love one another so that the world may know that we are the disciples of Christ. We give thanks. We want to lift up this time into your hands. We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ.
God, we will go to time of tithes and offerings, so ushers, please come forward.